Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, could one of us please lead in prayer? Prabhakar. Yes, Pastor. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, acknowledge your holy name. At this moment, we have come unto your throne of grace. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to learn and grow together. Father, bless this class. Uh, bless Pastor Paul and all of our classmates and lead us, Holy Spirit, so that we can learn whatever you are, you want us to learn and grow in your uh, divine realm, Father. Thank you so much. And as this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Prabhakar. Okay, so what we did last week, we uh, went from chapter 13. We talked about the great uh, chapter on love uh, and how Paul sums up the entire chapter saying, uh, it's good that you all have gifts and you're flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But if you do not have love, it is just a sounding gong, which means everything that we do should be out of the basis of love. And then we went into chapter 14 as well, where in chapter 14, Paul talks about this very important, um, two very important aspects in, uh, in terms of flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, one was speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues, right? Uh, so there were people, Paul says in, uh, in many verses, he says, uh, if somebody is speaking in tongues, let there be an interpreter. Why? Because he gives a couple of reasons. He says, one, because uh, when we're speaking in tongues, we're speaking a heavenly language and not everyone can say amen to it because they don't understand it. Right. So if there is an imp interpreter, go ahead and speak in tongues. Right. Uh, and this is mainly what he's talking about is in a, a public setting. So in a church setting. So Paul is not saying don't speak in tongues because he follows that up by saying that uh, I speak in tongues more than any one of you, but I would rather speak one word of uh, understanding in the church to help uh, the church congregation, right? So he's he's putting the emphasis, right? The gifts of the Holy Spirit is important. Speaking in tongues is important, but in a public setting, uh, if you're speaking in tongues, have an interpreter right uh, and then he also talked about prophecy the gift of prophecy right uh, we'll talk a little bit more we are almost to the end of chapter 14 in the gift of prophecy he says i desire that everyone prophesy but when you prophesy do it in order right uh, don't just prophesy out of the blue or don't just prophesy in an unorderly manner he says uh, let there be orderly worship right orderly uh, an orderly service, right? So when you're speaking in tongues or when you're when you're prophesying, uh, let one person prophesy at one time, and if somebody is you know relating to that prophecy, let them acknowledge it and pray uh, for it, right? Uh, and so he goes on to that chapter. Right now we have stopped. Uh, let me just pull up the notes. Yes, so we stopped at uh, this order in exercise of spiritual gifts. So we'll continue from here. Uh, so that's from verse 26 onwards, right? So verse 26, chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 onwards, right? So let's go on. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. So you see here, Paul is saying, uh, if anyone speaks in a tongue, so maybe the congregation, if there are 10 people, if there are three people who speaks in tongues, give each, let each one of them speak at one time, uh, take a turn, each one of them, and let one person interpret. So you see, he's he's going into the minute details on how we should exercise the gifts of the Spirit, right? Then he says here, 28, but if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God, right? So he's saying here, in church, 
if there is no interpreter it is better you pray with an understanding right and when you when in your personal time you pray in the holy spirit pray in the uh, pray in tongues verse 29 let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge but if anyone is revealed to another who sits by let the first keep silent sorry but if anything is revealed to another who sits by let the first keep silent for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged right now the word here uh, i really like this word it says that all may learn and be encouraged right so what is paul emphasizing two things he's emphasizing one is all can develop in the gift of prophecy two we must learn how to you know release the prophetic word right oh, and we've said this many times the prophetic word is a word directly coming from god but we are human vessels so we can release that prophetic word sometimes in an arrogant way or uh, or we may cut short some things from the prophetic word or we may add additional things to the prophetic word so paul is saying that we may learn and that others may be encouraged so and and verse 32 and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets for god is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints right and we all uh, i think many of us you know we use this verse right god is not a spirit of uh, you know, not the author of confusion but of peace now why is paul saying this it is most probably that when the church is flowing in the gifts of the spirit right there was a lot of confusion how for example there are three people prophesying in one corner there are another three people speaking in tongues and there's another person trying to interpret here and so there was no order flowing in the gifts very good but there was no order it was a lot of confusion so what's happening you know, now if you picture it in, our, in in the setting that we are in today imagine a church with 50 people 10 people are prophesying 10 people are speaking in tongues two people are praying for gift of healing and it's all there's no order right and so paul is saying god is not the author of confusion so whenever we are having a yes it's the spirit of god it is god ministering to us but even when god ministers he doesn't cause confusion he does things in the right way in a proper manner and so basically paul is trying to um, encourage the church he's not saying don't flown the gifts he's saying when you do it do it in an orderly manner now for us it's very easy to you know sometimes we may think how why did why didn't the corinthian church just you know take turns and prophesy in order or you know speak in tongues and in an orderly manner now we must understand that over time we have learned and the church has grown has there's revelation upon revelation and we have learned over time but this is the early church, the first century church. They probably had no idea how a church, a church looks like. And, you know, in Corinth, there was a Jewish colony. So a couple of, you know, there were a few Jews living, uh, but it was mostly a Gentile church. So the Gentiles have no idea about you know, worship or they have no idea about, you know, uh, flowing in the gifts of the spirit, how a church service looks like. They don't know right so paul is you know trying to make them understand you see you notice here paul is not upset with them right in the first few issues the apostle paul was upset he said you know, there is division there is strife there is uh, the way you are taking the lord's table is not in a worthy manner and you're uh, you know you're saying that i i'm not an apostle and i'm not somebody who can speak into your life so the first few issues he was very upset with them but here he's being very kind because he understands that they don't know about it and so he's teaching them right so let's look at a few points here right uh those speaking in tongues to a congregation let me just highlight that those speaking in tongues in to a congregation should pray for interpretation and the interpretation could be brought forth by the same person who gave the message or by someone else right uh, and he goes on at one point 
at any point, let there be up to three people in front to give messages in tongues with interpretation. And I think uh, in a time that we are in, even we can do this, right? Of course, it's, it's very rare that we see people with the gift of interpretation of tongues. Uh, but there are people around us. There could be people around us. And if there is, there are people who are uh, interpreting. Give them opportunity. Let them interpret. Let them let because we know that. See, Paul says, when I'm praying in the spirit, uh, fourteen verse fourteen, he says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So there's nothing wrong in interpreting and saying, hey, this is what you've been praying for. You've been praying for our government, for our leaders in the government. So it's an encouragement, right? And then he talks about prophecy. If there are prophecies being brought into the congregation at any point, let there be three people in front taking turns. One is speaking, others judge. Uh, uh, in a sense, the others keep silent and listen. And this way, all can take the prophecy while others can judge the prophecy. Now, remember, all prophecy must be judged. This means that if anything is wrong, it must be discarded. Okay, let me give you this example why prophecy must be judged, right? Uh, I remember many, many years ago, uh, you know, I, I just became a believer, and, uh, you know, my mother got me a, actually, my brother and me, uh, she got us a bike, right? Uh, and we were very excited. So we had to come to, we would come to college together. And one day, this man of God came home, right? And, the moment he came home, he's uh, and we were just there at home, and he said, he said, uh, sell this bike because I see that you are going to meet with an accident, and you're going to have a injury, and it's going to be a lot of problems. So before this bike gives you any problems or causes you to be in the hospital, better sell this bike. Now, what is the first response that we must have for this? Oh my God, God is this bike is a curse, is it? I have to go and sell it. What must be the first response? I the first thing I said is I cancel that prophetic that word in Jesus' name in front of the pastor. Right? He must have been a pastor who was about 30 years in ministry. But I said I cancel that in Jesus' name. Because what does the Bible say? The Bible says, I have come to give you life and life in abundance. One. And God says when he blesses us, he adds no sorrow to it. So the, the bike is a blessing from God. Why would he add sorrow to it? And God does not want us to you know, meet with an accident. That's, that's, uh, I just rejected it, and I discarded that prophecy, and I said, I cancel it in Jesus' name. I still use that bike. Right? And I've never met with an accident. Right? So all prophecy must be judged. Right? Uh, the spirit of the prophet is subject. This is also very important. It's subject to the prophet. So when we are working with the Holy Spirit, when we are releasing a prophetic word, uh, we have control over when and how to release a prophetic word. Right? For example, many a times, uh, you know, we are during the worship time, maybe on a Sunday service, the worship is going on. We may have got a prophetic word, right? But I'm not going and saying, OK, worship leader, stop. I have a prophetic word, so let me release that prophetic word now before I forget. I can't do that. Why? Because I'm, I, then I'll be disrupting the worship time, the worship, the worship leader who's prepared and people are in worship. I can't go in between and say, stop, I've got a prophetic word. Right? I have control. Right? The Holy Spirit has given me the word. A prophetic word, maybe for somebody in the church, or maybe for the nation, the city, whatever it is. But I have the control, so I can, I can wait. I can finish with the worship, finish with the announcements, finish with the preaching of the word of God, and in the end of the service, I can say, you know, this is a prophetic word that I, that I have. I just want to release it. Now, how do I? How have we done it? In an orderly manner. Right? So there are times, uh, we, you know, early morning we, when we wake up for prayer on Sunday so, uh, you know, in my personal time, I've got a prophetic word. I knew it is for the church, but I didn't go and say, okay, church has come. First, let's give the prophetic word. No, 
let the service go on start the worship finish with the word and at the end of the service i've given the prophetic word. why because we are, we are we are subject to it right we are under control right so we must know how to release a prophetic word when to release and 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 you know uh, why to release it right and even as we develop right it's not like i haven't made mistakes we all have made mistakes i personally have made mistakes while releasing prophetic words but it's good that uh, so i learned over time okay so when i release the word i must be more uh, you know uh, more simpler in the way i release the message use words and sentences that can help them understand give examples through that prophetic word give try to give them a uh, uh, you know uh, the understanding of that prophetic word that has been released right so paul is saying to the church when you're speaking in tongues when you're flowing in the gift of prophecy do it in an orderly manner then he goes on to talk about women keep silent now earlier in this chapter uh, in chapter 11 paul said that women can pray women can prophesy uh, uh, in in public publicly in public gatherings in church gatherings he says that right uh, he says that all including women are to walk in love to walk in spiritual gifts to prophesy everyone where including women can flow in all the nine gifts of the spirit so what is paul trying to communicate here when he's saying what he's saying in verse 34 and 35 let's look at it let your women keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but they are to be submissive as the law also says and if they want to learn something let them ask their own husbands at home for it is shameful for women to speak in the church now when you look at this passage and you look at it with one uh, you know with one context just thinking okay women should not speak in public gatherings if you look at it that way we will interpret this uh, to these two passages in a very wrong way and we can you know make our own uh, dogma or an, our own uh, understanding out of this right? but what is Paul trying to say right remember the head covering it was for women who were married same thing goes here right the Greek word for woman is gune which is a woman a wife right so Paul is talking specially to married women He's saying, if you get a prophetic word, right, women, you go back to your husbands, right, ask them, let them ask their husbands at home, right? Now, if it, it had to do with a wife wanting to learn something for which she speaks and asks her husband about the matter, then Paul is saying, see, uh, if you look at this now, in the culture during that time, you had men sitting in one place, women sitting in another place. Okay, so it was a culture. Even in Jewish synagogues, if you see here, you got men in one place, women in the other place, and that custom is still followed in our nation, especially in India, in the north of India, right? So we got men and women who sit on two different sides uh, of of in the church, but. Paul is trying to bring this picture, right? He's saying, see, woman, wife, if you have a prophetic word, if you have a word uh, and you're not sure about it and you want to ask, first thing, you ask your husband. Don't stand up in the church and say, this is what I want to do. Go, uh, you know, don't, 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 you know, disrupt the service or don't just say things which may not be effective at that moment, right? So he's saying, first check with your husband. See, you can discuss the matter together if you want, right? That's why in this regard, Paul is saying, a woman, you're first submitted to your husband, then comes the pastor and the prophet and all of that. First woman, a husband, husband submitted to the woman, right? And so. Paul is saying in this matter, keep silent. He's not saying don't talk, don't prophesy, don't uh, uh, you know uh, speak in tongues. No, he's saying in with this regard, in the church, you keep silent, right? 
because you, you willingly submit to your husband go back home if you get a prophetic word if you get a uh, you know a word of knowledge or anything speak with your husband do it together yeah right? discuss together uh, but don't disrupt the church service and he goes on here in this so what does he mean to keep silent speak in tongues to the church audience if there is someone who will flow in interpretation then there he says keep silent so three places where paul says keep silent if you're speaking in tongues have an interpreter if not keep silent two take turns to prophesy when you have delivered your prophecy then keep silent and let someone else prophesy three women if you have any questions in the church this is what he's talking about right now uh, women you may not understand few things if you have questions don't you know, you know don't stand up and disrupt the church at that time keep silent in church ask your husbands at home later on so what does it say here now if i look at it in a broader picture and if i don't understand the scripture uh, uh, it'll say that hey clearly women are not supposed to speak in the church but that's not true and i repeat this again because apostle paul raised up many women leaders for example lydia was was a leader in the church in i think it was thessalonica right he was a, she was a leader right uh, a, a merchant in uh, uh in a uh, cloth merchant and she was a leader in the church aquila and priscilla priscilla again was the leader in the church right? so there is it, there's, when we look at it, we must look at it, uh, taking into consideration the Greek, taking into consideration the cultural background. So when Paul is saying, keep silent, he's saying, don't interrupt the church service uh, at that moment, but go back home, submit to your husbands, ask them. And then you can come back. And if, if it's something that your husband says, OK, you can release the prophetic word, uh, maybe you can do that in the following weeks. Right now, how do I put this in the setting that we are in right now? Right now, I can't go home. Maybe women are there in a church; they can't go home and give, you know, check with their husbands about the prophetic word, and then come to church the following. Right now, we don't have to do that. Why? Because we understand that there must be order in the church. Remember, this is the early church. They don't know order in the church. They, they are still learning. But now we are in a time and a place where we have learned over time, right? So uh, even if women get a prophetic word, if people, if the pastor or the preacher is calling, they can come forward, give a prophetic word, but give it in the right way, in an orderly manner, right? Uh, so we must understand these things, right? Uh, this is written to the early church, the first century church. They're still learning and they're still growing, right? And we are in a place where we have, uh, you know, over time matured as a congregation, as a church of Christ, right? So we come to the end, uh, verse 40, he says, let all things be done. Hold on, let me just read that verse. Let all, be, all, let all things be done decently and in order. Right, so all, all the gifts of the spirit, and all the diversities of tongues, uh, let everything, let everyone be encouraged as believers to flow in it. But when you're operating in these gifts, do it. Let all things be done decently and in order. Why? Because God is the one who's giving us these gifts. God is not the author of confusion right so we come to the end of this chapter chapter 14 uh, any questions anyone has any questions regarding this entire chapter yes uh, just hold on yes Mangi, please go ahead thank you pastor um just a question on uh, just the last part of uh, uh chapter 14. Hmm. one is uh the relevant of uh, the verses we just read now, or one of uh, the women keeping silent in in in, in the church, hmm. is it still uh, is that verse still relevant today? Because today 
uh, we understand that every single person can be filled with the Holy Spirit, every single person can preach. Um, secondly, uh, Paul telling wives to go and ask their husbands home. What if those husbands did not know the word? Mm. Where, where were they leading their, their wives? Were they just causing confusion or Paul was just ask, uh, responding based on the question he was asked? Thank, Thank you. you. So, thank you, Mangi. Yeah. So, the first answer to your uh, the first first question is, uh, Mangi. This is only for the church. It's not relevant now. Just like the head covering, right? It's it was for the women who are married who had to cover their heads as a sign of uh, submission to their wives to their husbands. Uh, so, right now, this is not relevant to us. It was only for the Corinthian church women. Uh, don't speak, keep silent, was only for the Corinthian church, right? It's not relevant to us now, right? So so right now, women can preach, teach, prophesy, do everything, right? Uh, now two is in during that time, during the first century church, probably in the Corinthian church, now we must understand that many of these women have come from the you know, their background has been an adulterous life, right? They were probably prostitutes and uh, they were in the temple of Aphrodite. Now they've come out of prostitution and all of that, right? Now, as prostitutes, they were, uh, if you read about the culture of Corinth, you, you'll, you know, we learn so much from there. As prostitutes, they were very open. They never cared about what people think. They never cared about what uh, the, uh, you know what uh, civilians think or what uh, leaders think they were prostitutes they they were open about it there were thousands of male and female prostitutes they were open about it right now these people these prostitutes who are more open more uh, willing to you know talk out loud they they are not shy they don't uh, they don't feel like okay i should keep quiet no they're very open about their things now they have become believers and they've come into the church Right now, Paul says in Second Corinthians five seventeen, if anyone in, is in Christ, he's a new creation. So what's happened here, Mangi, is in the church they've these people who are prostitutes living in sexual immorality, they've become believers. Their spirit is new, but their mind has not yet been transformed. Right, so they still feel that they can talk however they want to, behave however they want to, and that they're doing in the church. Right, so Paul is telling them, "Listen, this is church, right? And in church, you must submit to your husband first. Now, whether the husband the the husband may not know much of the word of God, that's all right. But you're submitting to the husband, right? And that was priority for Apostle Paul, right? He's saying, wife, you submit to the husband." whether he knows something whether he doesn't know anything whether he's a great person whether he's just a simple man you submit to your husband because god has ordained you to submit to your husband that is number one now whether he doesn't know the word and if he doesn't know the working of the holy spirit then you can you know think of doing other things like right? you you uh, when we look at uh, in in Corinth, they now, he says in many in many places he says when you all meet on a regular basis you all can you know uh, break bread and meet and so what i would say is mangi what is paul trying to say here he's trying to say that women firstly you you submit to the husband and then you can be submissive to the church as well now if the husband doesn't know then you can you know probably ask uh, but not during the church service you ask people, you know, uh, there'll be times of fellowship. You ask, grow together, learn together. Uh, so, but the main point is one, it is not for the church today because women are allowed to preach, teach everything. Two is he's just trying to bring that whole aspect of women. I know you all were living a very liberal life, doing whatever you felt like uh, in the open, but now you all are born again. You need to also change the way. Uh, you behave so first submit to your husbands right ask them if you get a prophetic word ask them 
don't just go and do whatever you feel like and the husband will feel hey well, what am i here now again this again is subject only to the time of the of, of when the church was at corinth right uh, so it's not uh, applicable now uh, is what i would like to say yes say go ahead oh thank you pastor um while you were talking i was i, I completely agree with you and, and and i'm all for the point that um, the instruction was specifically for the church of corinth but again i think the principle of submission mm. you know goes a long way as something we can also learn even though it was specifically for the church of corinth because even in our data even in our church of today mm. there's still some element of uh, insubordination let me put, use that word or wives trying to or even let me say generally women and I'm, I'm not trying to bash women in any way but i've just seen it in in some instances where some women try or some wives try to you know um um be a bit i would say uh pushy or in the sense they want to show that they know the word so i think the principles they still uh we can still learn in the sense that you know um if a couple don't have or don't agree on something on the word the church should not be the place where they argue about it rather rather take it home and talk about it and see where they can where they're missing it and try to understand so i think that, that we can still learn the principle yes. of submission but i agree completely that this was an instruction specifically for the courage church Yes, thank you, thank you so much, Say. Yes, uh, I would like to add that that's, that that was very well put, Say. Thank you so much. Say says, uh, the act, right? So the act is not something that we follow, but the principle is something that we have to carry. For example, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. We don't have to go around washing people's feet. We don't do the act, but the principle is humility. So that's what Say was trying to say. Thank you so much, Say. Right. So the act of submission, the act of you know, uh, uh, women to not preach, uh, but so in terms of you know, women and uh, husband, uh, you know, how women go home and ask your husband was basically the principle is submission. You submit to your husband. Right. right that's nice. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, Stacia, please go ahead. Hi, Pastor. Hi, everyone. Um, I agree with Say, but on a different um, side to this, why mm. you find women today somewhat, some may say, some are rebellious, um, or because they feel they have to defend? Because some persons, even though it was the context of the earlier church, you have some ministers are still using this as a level of control. So you mm. find that the woman now takes up this, it's some sort of disrespect, but they have to keep defending themselves. Defend, I have a right to be here. I have a right to be heard. So then you have now the feminists and mm. you have all these different people calling what they are. And it, it's a constant fight a battle and some say you know what i don't need a husband i don't need a man mm. because he puts me down or whatever which are, are some person they dislike the bible because it seemed to be pointing in that regard why a man have to be head over me etc which the the con the principle is not for if the man if you have a man that is godly which is god is the head and then the, the husband is supposed to be you know following god and then you can submit to him and not feel it's not mm. a level of control it's not slavery and mm. so you feel your voice can be heard respectfully and uh, support mm. you and you can disagree to agree yeah. etc and discuss in your own private space so but some do not agree even to this day and that's why you have the yeah. breakaway from marriages, et cetera, and it spills over in other areas of society. Yes. Yes, that's very true, Taisha. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I would like to add this, you know, uh, 
in a time that we are in and there are some wonderful women who have started their own ministries and we don't even know who their husbands names right so they've started their own ministries and they're doing so wonderfully right uh, blessing the body of christ just just powerful ministries uh but one thing that we always encourage in uh you know is it's good because when when women take up that whole call of god upon their life and there's a calling they they take it up they do well and they just raise up in the ministry and they raise up leaders they're doing really well in the ministry but we must always women should must always remember that at home they're not a pastor right and even men i would say even men right men also we we can have the greatest ministry and all of that but at home we are not a pastor we are husband and wife right and and the women also must understand that however big their ministry is however well they're doing god may be using them very greatly but your husband may be somebody who's just working a nine to five job uh yet you are to submit to your husband and why and husbands again you may be a we may be great in our ministry having a great work and god is just using us so powerfully uh but we must remember that our wife is our helper and we need to uh you know be together and honor uh, honor them and uh and so at home it's always husband and wife it is not pastor and uh, wife or pastor and husband it, it is not that way so so that is a distinction that we must learn to draw right so especially as ministers because we're so used to people calling us pastor people calling us this they're giving us so much of importance you know we have to go here we have to do this uh, and we forget the small things hey i've got a home and at my home i'm not a pastor just a husband i'm a father uh, or at home i'm not a i'm not a you know a prophetess i'm just a wife and i will submit to my husband um and i'm just a mother here and so i want so there are two different these are two different places with two different callings uh and so thank you teisha for sharing that as well thank you right uh yes louis go ahead good morning pastor good morning everyone good morning. um just another side track um I, I, if i can run this story quickly um there's a testimony i had of a minister that um um, the anointing, yes, as a pastor in church, he does the prayers, and there's so much testimony in church. But they were struggling at home mm -hmm. until the wife recognized the anointing on the hus on the husband's life at home. Then the anointing began to work for them at home. So where do we bring in that also that balance where we recognize the graces that the spouses carry? But at the same time, we have to function as husband and wife. But the grace also can function for them or for them at home so where do we bring in that that sense of balance where we are not taking for granted but at the same time we recognize the graces mm. that god has placed on the life that's why it can work for them at home because until she recognized the anointing of him as a pastor at home before the anointing could work for her at home that, but that's our own personal testimony so where do we bring in that kind of yes. balance yes thank you so much louis uh, um here's what i would say now picture this right maybe a husband is a is a man of god doing a ministry and he's used powerfully prophetic word of knowledge and uh, god has been using him wonderful ministry and maybe the uh, the wife is just you know helping out in ministry just doing small things but uh you know just helping out with the church not really in the ministry but just you know being there now we must remember that when we go back home a husband and wife who are serving the church or when they're at home doesn't mean the gifts of the holy spirit will stop and say okay no i will only give you the you know anointing in in church we know that the anointing is there right god can speak to us through the small things in the at home as well so here's what we can do uh now if i recognize something about my wife i know the grace of god uh, upon you know oh, my wife then what must i do i must understand that hey she's maybe she's sharing this because you know this is something that god is speaking to her right so i i should not be in a place where i say okay you know leave all of that only in the church 
right? Yes, prophecies, word of knowledge, all of that. We want to have it, you know, develop that and grow in that. And and it sounds nice when it's in the church or blessing the church, but God doesn't stop there. So we must understand that, okay, even as God is speaking to us at home, I recognize the gifts, I recognize the grace that God has, right? So for example, if, if my wife says, hey, can we uh, pray together for half an hour? Uh, now, I may be busy doing something, but I can stop what I'm doing because maybe God is you know, ministering to her and saying, let's pray. Right? Maybe uh, you know, this is something that God is leading her towards. So I don't have to make it sound super spiritual. Right? I, uh, you know, uh, or for example, I'm, I, I'm just there and I'm saying, okay, I feel led to be to pray together with my wife, but my wife is doing something. She's, you know, doing household work. I say, hey, why don't we pray? Now, she must recognize that, hey, maybe God is speaking or ministering. You know, saying that, hey, let's pray together. So I don't have to make it super spiritual by saying, uh, you know what? Just now I got a prophetic word, and God is saying right now we should pray. So we have to pray, and only when we pray, go. I don't have to make it sound super spiritual, right? Uh, I just say I can just be normal and say, hey, uh, when we have time, can we just spend a, half an hour in prayer? So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm still flowing in that gifts and that anointing, but I'm not you know, being trying to be super spiritual, trying to act as if I'm on the stage in front of hundreds of people. No, just being normal and saying, hey, after you finish your work, why don't we just spend half an hour in prayer? And if she uh, recognizes the gifts and call in my life, she will agree to it. Right. So that balance uh, is something that it's an ongoing learning, husband and wife. Right. Uh, but very important is, uh, Louis, as you said, we must learn to appreciate and understand the gifts and the grace that each one of us have, the husband and the wife. They have different grace gifts. Right? So we must learn to appreciate and walk together in that. Right? That, that understanding must be there. Uh, and it will come over time. You will know. Uh, and I feel just making life very simple, not making it super spiritual and just trying to go overboard, saying, hey, you know, this is what I feel that we must do, even in terms of making decisions for the home, uh, for the family, for the children. Um, just prayerfully, you know, uh, we don't have to say, okay, I feel that this is what the prophetic word that God is telling me right now. We don't have to say all that, right? So just be normal. Say, you know, I feel that God can lead us to this. Maybe let's pray and see if this is something. Uh, now, we may be very good in prophetic words, but I don't have to release it with, you know, with. Uh, you know, in in terms of in arrogance or anything, just be simple about it, right? And uh, yeah, so just recognizing each other, uh, being there for each other, honoring each other, and I think as we do that, uh, automatically the other things will fall in place. People will, uh, you know, the husband and the wife will begin to know. Okay, this is what he says when he says this. Maybe the Lord is speaking or ministering, and I must also value my wife or the husband and the wife must value each other whether they are in ministry or not in ministry uh, they must value each other right uh, so i will close with that right thank you so much for sharing your thoughts everyone thank you uh, what we'll do is we'll take a break because we have five minutes so before we get into the next chapter we'll take a break we'll come back at uh 9 55 right uh, we'll go back at 9 55 and we'll continue uh with chapter 15. Thank you.